and teaching, uh, and then one of the courses that I teach is a wonderful social media certification course that I teach in the Adina Public School System in Adult Education. And I had the pleasure of having Wendy as one of my students in the winter. And as a result, Wendy then connected me to Rajiv. And that's why I'm here today. Rajiv and I met to talk about ostensibly about social media. He asked me a little bit about my background, and I was pretty open about it, and I told him about this huge catastrophic business failure that I had experienced in 1996. His eyes lit up like a kid in a candy shop, and he said, you're my lead-off speaker for the symposium. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, happy may not be the correct word. It's forced me to pull down luggage and face demons that I have not faced in over 15 years and spent countless hours and how much money in therapy in order to be able to deal with the situation. But I did, and as a result, I am here. So I want to thank, I want to thank everybody for being here, and I want to thank Rajiv, Matt, and Wendy for making me a part of this at this point. To the facts. In 1990, or 1989, I was a co-owner with my former wife of a wonderful little marketing agency in Minneapolis. And we were pioneers. There was nothing we wouldn't do to meet our clients' objectives. And those her clients included the Fortune 100, from Travelers Insurance to Pillsbury to other major organizations around the country, because we saw the emerging value of direct marketing and latched on early, and it was very successful. In 1990, a local retail chain approached us about doing a database marketing project. And of course, we had never done a database marketing project before, but the answer was yes, that we would take it on because we understood the principle, we just needed to be able to work out the details. As a result, I hired these two young Johns Hopkins graduates, math whizzes, who came on board as our database experts and started working. The first day they were there, Evan, who was our IT guy, walks into my office and says, Jonathan, what's my email address? And I said, Evan, what's email? <laughs> and within 24 hours, we had the first Apple network set up in Minneapolis as an agency. And all 18 of my employees had email addresses, and we were using it functionally. I joined this wonderful chat room, an early chat room called Market L. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It was early on in the process. It was at a so uh, uh, University of Southern Florida. A uh, chairman of the marketing department ran it. And there I commingled online for the first time with some of the best marketing minds in the country, in the world. So I'm sitting at my desk and I'm going, okay, Jonathan, there's a way for me to gain my fortune, my fame and fortune with this new technology. I was exposed to a wonderful document called the Clue Train Manifesto. One word, Clue Train Manifesto. And I suggest that all of you who have not read it, Google it, find it and read it. And then you will understand the nature of not only social media, but also social commerce, which is very important. And I'm sitting there, and being the son of a grocer, all of a sudden, I had an epiphany. And if you want to see a room shake, watch a Jewish person have an epiphany. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh my lord, we need to do online grocery shopping. And this was in 1990, 1991. And I was so convinced of the successful potential of this online mega business that I went ahead and jumped into it, not only with both of my feet, but with both my hands, my eyes, and unfortunately, my brain. And it took over my life. And I built a team of extremely competent professionals that helped me build what was a wonderful online grocery environment that we would be able to take out and sell, not only to the retail, but to the manufacturers as well. One thing that I knew in my grocery experience that grocery stores don't make money on basically their retail sales. They're making it in a lot of other ways. And we knew that we couldn't build a retail model because it would be 
fruitless because to, we figured, or we calculated, pulling an order, receiving, pulling an order, and delivering it would cost about $24, and no retailer in their right mind would pay that kind of money for an order for groceries. So I looked to a good friend of mine, Condi Nast. Condi Nast is a hero. He set the standard for which we developed our business. We didn't build a retail model, we built a professional model. And on a typical 420-page website, we, we determined or we, in, uh, we identified 380 potential advertising spots within the website. Advertising that would be paid for by Pillsbury, Tropicana, uh, a number of businesses and companies that wanted it to advertise to the traffic that we were going to create on this website. And we used this brainstorm and we went to Spartan Foods in Wisconsin, 500 stores, sat down with them and said, this is our model. And we're gonna generate X amount of millions of dollars a year on your website for your 500 stores and we're cutting you in on the deal. And they went nuts. They said, bring us four manufacturers that'll do it and we'll let you do it. Uh, this time, my eyes were totally glazed over. My brain was frozen and I wasn't thinking about anything other than the success of this operation and invested heavily, personally and through the agency, for the process. Well, it was going really well. We pulled in about six major manufacturers to, to, uh, the, to advertise on the Spartan website and everything was set. All we needed was the millions of dollars we needed to set up the infrastructure, the computer program, the computers, everything that would be required to build this massive, massive website that would allow Spartan to reach its five uh, customers in its 500 stores. So then somebody said, well, I think it was my CPA, where are the funds coming from? And I went, oh. And then we, do, we planned about eight uh, investor meetings over a six-week period, six period, and hence the failure begins, because we failed to convince one investor in eight meetings that our concept was revolutionary, but it was doable and had great, great value and success. At the time, this was in 1995, if you remember, there was an awful recession going on in the United States. And we had started losing on the agency side massive revenue streams from Honeywell. The Brit bought Pillsbury and we lost that business, which was a mainstay of our agency's growth. And as a result of all of this, suffered a catastrophic and very, very difficult crash of the agency. And one day I had to let all of my employees go. People have been working for us for over 15 years. We were a family, and it was like breaking family up. And not only did I lose that family, but I also lost my personal family. Lost my entire wealth, everything that I accumulated over the years of running an agency and being an entrepreneur who knew, knew no fear of failure, and then continued to do that. The two key reasons that we failed the two key reasons as I look back and we failed was number one, blind passion, which I'm going to address in a second. And the second one was, I didn't have a CFO. I didn't have a controller. My CPA didn't have the backbone to stand up to me and say, no, you can't do this. You cannot spend this money without proving the revenue streams that it's going to create because I had created those even though they were fantastical in my mind. So as a result, we did crash and burn, and it was a uh, very, very bleak, dark, and difficult time for me personally. I didn't have Rajiv's 24 steps to failure to follow. <laughs> Rajiv, where were you in 1994 when I needed you? Just kidding. So as a result, I then started my life over again, penniless, without family, and in looking to the future as to what I was going to become, and here I am today. I want to point to riding on the shoulders of others because that's what it was all about. And I want to mention two people in particular whose shoulders I did ride on. One was my good friend, Brian Paulson. 
Brian had the guts. When I was in the depths of depression and insoluble, cranky, hard to deal with, who came to me, reached out, grabbed me by the throat and said, wake the hell up and help me realize that I had my life to live other than the failure that I just experienced. And, the, and Brian's not here today. The second one who is here today is my lovely fiance, wherever she is, my lovely fiance and business partner, Lisa Fetter, who took me under wing about 14 years ago and has given me the opportunity to find myself and to find my mojo once again, which was extremely important. So thank you for them. So the, the close, in, my, in closing, what I would like to say is that in spite of the hard failures that I made, the blind passion and the lack of financial intelligence and support, the one thing I do want to say is on the passion. The passion's critical. If you ignore the passion or deny the passion, it's not worth it. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You have to have that passion. Just make sure you keep a really close eye on it. Thank you very much.